But anyway, so I'd just like to introduce Paul Burley. Um, he's come all the way from America to be with us. So please give him a, a warm welcome. Thank you. Well, it's nice to be here. Had two hours of sleep on a 36-hour travel arrangement, and, but I've slept really well the last couple days, so uh, I'm ready and raring to go. Lunch is settling in pretty well for you all right now? <laughs> Siesta time? I'm going to move through pretty quickly on a lot of slides, so hopefully I'll keep your interest up, keep the number of words on the slides down the best I could, and um, minimize the amount of math that we'll go through, so hopefully uh, this will be pretty entertaining. I want to start with a definition of life uh, because it's, it's pertinent to what I'm talking about in terms of geometry, and I think that you'll come to appreciate that as we move along. <clears throat> in school, we probably all uh, were told that the good definition of life has to do with metabolism and reproduction and uh, the power of adaptation to the environment as a result of internal uh, activities within the, within the organism. But I would propose that a better definition of life is a, is a simpler one, that life is communication with intent. So any communication that occurs within the universe, if there's an intent behind it, that is not only an indicator of life, that is life. If we are not communicating with anything, there's no sense in us being here. So the question then is, how, within how broad of a context do we find intent uh, as an indicator of life uh, in this universe? Therefore, based on that, uh, on that definition of life, cosmic consciousness or Christ consciousness, so forth, has an intent because there's a communication going on between us. So my thesis today is that cosmic consciousness provides symbols for comprehending and communicating relationships between each other, that's between you and me, everyone else in this room, us and the earth, us and the cosmos, and us and the creator, however we envision that creator to be. And that goes for all cultures throughout time and around the world as well. That this is a common thread that binds the fabric of humankind across time and space for perhaps um, millions of years, as we'll see. And the concept of the sacred is communicated in the form of circular geometrical symbolism, and that that symbolism is continuity of, uh, across cultures and it is specific to a particular type of, of geometry. Although that geometry in each culture is temporal and it changes over time and, over, and across space. But ultimately, these, each of these circular symbols is a 2D facet of a very specific three-dimensional geometry, which you can guess is going to be spherical. So this is a common, uh, this is all common within the framework of all ancient and indigenous cultures, and it's, represented in various traditions, including the arts, architecture, mythology, ritual, and ceremony. You can see these geometrical implications, these understandings of sacred concepts within these uh, various arts and sciences. Ultimately, one of the most important points I want to leave you with is that the circle is a proxy for the sphere. So when we talk about uh, stone circles, I believe that every stone circle is actually representing a spherical structure. And that seems to be the case from a geometrical standpoint, as I'll, as I'll show you. So for example, when we look at these ley lines or the, the avenue between uh, Avebury and the sanctuary, rather than that being a roadway, I would tend to think of it more of, as a, of a tube of energy that's flowing between these sites, not one that's just level at our eye level or where we sense it. There's a, a tube of some diameter, and I would propose that some investigation be done along those lines to take a look at the three-dimensionality of these, of these avenues, for example. The fundamental geology, uh, geometry uh, with regard to the sphere consists of nine great circles with a specific spatial relationship that I will show you. This is important because it comes up virtually every time when I look at uh, uh, circular sacred symbols. And the symbol, a spherical symbol, is, is representing universal sacred concepts. Every culture throughout time around the world assigns the circle as representing these types of communication relationships that I spoke of before. Uh, it, that is uh, 
We find that in every culture. And it's been expressed over thousands, and as I said before, perhaps millions of years. Finally, the other imp real important uh, comment to make is that this all concerns the nature of the universe and our place within it. That's what these symbols are trying to rel relate to us, that these relationships between us and the earth and the cosmos and creator are the most sacred relationships that there are. They are fundamental. They are um, important to all of us. They have been always important to us. They will continue to be important to all of us. And that's what life is all about, communication between these, these various entities, okay? So here we have uh, a number of objects from about 1.5 million years ago from Africa, Old of I Gorge, if you're familiar with that. A number of these are hammer stones uh, with a spherical form being uh, created as a result of smashing other rocks to create implements, tools, and so forth. Other than that, there are these diamond shapes on the lower part of the, of the screen. And these shapes come up time and time and time again. Specifically why, we don't know. But it's curious that in the upper right-hand portion of the screen, we have a stone that chips have been uh, taking off of it, and they've created this diamond shape on there. And yet of even more interest, the large stone in the lower right appears to have three large chips taken out of it. And this stone was found with a, within a context where these types of pebbles, this lithology, if it was a granite or a sandstone, whatever this stone was, is not common to this location where it was found. In other words, it had to be transported in. The suggestion being that this stone has no utilitarian value. It's not a hammer stone. It probably wasn't meant to be created this way. But whoever picked it up and carried it, carried it because it had some intrinsic value to it. The geometry may very well be that intrinsic value, that the something was recognized of value in this stone, even though it couldn't be used for anything by um, this proto-human uh, 1.5 million years ago. So there's something going on with the geometry even at that time, that there was a, a continued creation of certain geometrical forms that were recognized as being important. When this began, no one knows. You may be familiar with these types of structures in South Africa. Tens and tens of thousands of them. This is just one. And you'll see that even at going back that far, we have circular structures made of dry stack stone. They're in poor condition, but you can still recognize the circular nature of these structures. So there's an exterior wall, roughly circular. And even within the interior of it, we have uh, circular rooms. And there's something of importance, something of value, something that is needed in terms of these structures that they had to be around. Gobekli Tepe, here we have three of the temples. And obviously they are round, uh, very similar. There's something going on that there's, the circularity is important in these structures, again, being temples. So I would propose that the same reasoning is going behind the construction of these round temples in each of these, each of these cases, even though these are now dating rather than 70,000 or plus years ago. Now here we're looking at 9, 10, 11,000 years ago, something like that. But still the architecture is still the same with the dry stack uh, stone walls. Other than that, the, the rectangles are T-shaped uh, pillars or columns, and it's interesting to note that Within them, each of them have two pillars that are